Greetings again, everybody, and welcome to our updated talk on sarcoidosis. This is not so common uh, in person uh, as far as what you're going to see in the clinic, but it is a very commonly tested um, disease process um, because it involves a little bit of physiology. Um, so in any of the three steps, you're bound to run into this um, at some point. All right. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. All right, let's just do a quick overview of sarcoidosis because I'm sure most of you have already heard of this disorder. Sarcoidosis is a multi-systemic disorder, so you're going to see manifestations in all sorts of bodily systems. It is characterized by non-caseating granulomas. So what that means is that you have granulomas, similar to what you would see in TB, but if you were to get a biopsy of that granuloma, you would not see any organisms, you would just see a non-caseated granuloma. It is of unknown etiology. Uh, it predominantly affects the lungs, which is why it's in the pulmonary section here, and also can affect the surrounding lymph nodes, as we're going to see when we look at chest x-rays. Often, it's a diagnosis of exclusion. We uh, can mix it up sometimes with TB, fungal lung diseases, and as we're going to see, a very important one, beryliosis, which is not common, but... Again, it's very common on exams. Sarcoidosis can affect a variety of systems and organs, including the eyes, where it can cause uveitis, a very important one, the skin, where it can cause lupus perneo. It can also cause erythema nodosum. It can affect the nervous system, where it tends to cause Bell's palsy, which is a cranial nerve 7 palsy. It can affect the liver, it can affect the kidneys due to nephrocalcinosis. It can also affect the heart. If you get granulomas, um, granulomatous inflammation in the heart, it can cause a conduction defect resulting in an arrhythmia. It can affect the bone. You usually see those punched out lesions, similar to what you see in multiple myeloma. And it can affect other tissue. Classically, women are affected more than men. Blacks are affected uh, slightly more than whites, and the age of onset is young adulthood, 20s to 30s. The characteristic finding of sarcoidosis is bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy, which you will see on chest x-ray. So the history. On the USMLE, typically this is going to be a black woman in her 20s to 30s, coming in with cough, dyspnea, and constitutional symptoms. So perhaps she's got fever, fatigue, weight loss, maybe uh, some joint pain. Um, it's pretty typical when you have a chronic inflammatory process. So the symptoms, cough, dyspnea, shortness of breath, chest pain, malaise, fatigue, fever, arthralgias, just very nonspecific symptoms. However, what would give this away, not, not that you're going to see it all the time, uh, would be that lupus perneo, which I'll show you pictures of, uh, or uveitis. But this tends to happen later on in the course of the disease. So what is this lupus perneo? Uh, what it is is a, a rash. It's red indurated plaques. And it tends to happen on the face, so the nose, the cheek, the lips, and the ears. Physical exam in sarcoidosis is notoriously unremarkable. Even the lungs are going to sound fairly normal, despite the fact that this primarily presents with pulmonary symptoms. So you're not going to see the crackles, unlike other interstitial lung diseases. Diagnosis. Best initial test is a chest x-ray. If you suspect sarcoidosis, your next step is to get a chest x-ray. And what you will see most of the time is bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy. And you may see some pulmonary infiltrates, which reflects the interstitial nature of this lung disease. The most accurate test is a biopsy. A biopsy. Why? Because it'll show you granulomas, and that will tell you that you're dealing with sarcoidosis. 
Now, a biopsy is also necessary if you're between sarcoidosis and a lymphoma. And remember that lymphomas obviously affect the lymph nodes, and so you could see a hyalur lymphadenopathy with uh, a lymphoma as well. However, you're not going to see lupus perneo, you're not going to see um, the skin manifestations and the uh, other uh, multisystemic manifestations that you see in sarcoidosis. Some pearls for the USMLE, kind of getting away from sarcoidosis here. Um, sarcoidosis is a very common distractor for beryliosis. So you hear a patient coming in with maybe some systemic signs, cough, pulmonary issues, and then you do a chest x-ray and you see bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy or granulomas. Often it's a knee-jerk reaction to think sarcoidosis, but you need to look into the patient's history. If you are dealing with an older man with a history of working with metals or working in the nuclear aerospace industry, then you got to think beryliosis. If, on the other hand, you're dealing with a younger woman, particularly if it's uh, if she's a black woman, and you know, I'm really hammering on the black woman part because it just comes up all the time on the exam, um, but you know, it doesn't mean it has to be that uh, subset of patients. Um, in, in real life, it just comes up that way on exams. Um, now with sarcoidosis, again, it's going to be a younger woman, uh, 20s to 30s, and she'll often have cutaneous manifestations. Now, another thing is that granulomas make an enzyme called 1-alpha-hydroxylase. Where do we normally see that? We see that in the kidneys. It's part of the uh, vitamin D biosynthesis pathway. And so what that means is that you are going to have high levels of 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, which is the active form of vitamin D. So that 1-alpha-hydroxylase that's made by granulomas, for whatever reason, I don't know why, uh, but that 1-alpha-hydroxylase is going to increase your amount of vitamin D, and consequently it's going to increase your absorption and retention of calcium. So the result is that a lot of patients with sarcoidosis end up with high calcium levels, hypercalcemia, and that's one kind of distinctive process um, that you may see on labs. Granulomas also make angiotensin converting enzyme. Now that doesn't manifest clinically, that's just a lab finding. It's not reliable, however you may hear it thrown around. So as I mentioned, the best initial test is a chest x-ray. The most accurate test is a biopsy, uh, which will show granulomas, and you will not see organisms unlike uh, what you would see in tuberculosis. Other tests can be performed. A Manto test can help you distinguish TB. CBC, because it's a chronic inflammatory process, you may see anemia of chronic disease. BMP, if you do have renal failure due to nephrocalcinosis, you could see renal insufficiency. You can get granulomas in the liver that would result in elevated liver enzymes. Serum calcium could be elevated, as we already mentioned. Serum ACE could also be elevated. Pulmonary function tests. This is chiefly a restrictive lung disorder, restrictive pulmonary disease. And so you would tend to see a restrictive pattern. And when I say restrictive pattern, that's a particular pattern on pulmonary function tests. Go back and watch my physiology video if you're not sure what that means. However, sometimes you may see a mixed restrictive and obstructive pattern, but you should see elements of a restrictive pattern. The DLCO is going to show reduced diffusion in advanced disease, highlighting the fact that this is an interstitial process. Bronchioalveolar lavage is occasionally done, and what you'll tend to see is an elevated CD4 to CD8 ratio, and that's typical because CD4 cells are responsible for the formation of granulomas. And so the ratio will be more than 3.5. This is fairly low yield. However, it is very specific if you get this lab. This is a normal chest x-ray here. I'm gonna try and change my color here to red. Hopefully this will work. Okay, so notice that you have fairly clear markings. Um, you do see nodes. Um, you do see um, you know, your, your, uh, you know, a little bit of, of, uh, of, 
not infiltrates, but you see pulmonary markings. Um, but this is a normal chest x-ray. Now let's compare this to bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy where you see much more shadowing in the uh, hilar area. So right here and right here, this is very prominent bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. You see a little bit of increased lung markings, but again, that tends to happen later in the course. Again here, you see big nodes. These are hilar lymph nodes. And see, also here you see some increased interstitial markings, particularly in the lower lung fields. All right, in this you particularly see the increased markings. The hilar lymph lymphadenopathy is a little bit more difficult to see here, um, but you can definitely see those interstitial markings. This is lupus pernio. So you can see that this is a very indurated plaque. This would feel very rough and tense uh, if you were to palpate it. Notice that it's happening around the nose. It can also happen in the cheeks, around the lips, and also in the ears. It's not going to happen in all those places necessarily, but you tend to see it there. So here you can see it on this one, and you can see it on the cheeks and on the nose. Now this is erythema nodosum. Erythema nodosum looks like big welts on the legs, tends to be on the shins. Um, so you see it like right here. They almost look like little abscesses, okay? So again here you see erythema nodosum. This tends to be painful, okay? If you were to press on these, they may be painful. The mainstay of treatment for sarcoidosis is corticosteroids. You've got to know that. That is what we use to treat these patients. Now, are there steroid sparing agents that may be used? Yes, but the first step in management and treatment is corticosteroids. So you can use something like prednisone. On diagnosis, all patients should get an ophthalmologic exam because of the risk of uveitis. You want to get a baseline. They should get an EKG. Remember the fact that you can develop granulomas in the heart tissue, which can lead to conduction defects. You should get pulmonary function tests because this is primarily a lung disorder, and then follow up routine labs and NSAIDs for pain. Complications include progressive pulmonary fibrosis, congestive heart disease um, due to core pulmonale, and sudden cardiac death due to the arrhythmias. One final note, there's a disorder called Lofgren syndrome, and this is characterized by a triad of erythema nodosum, joint pain, and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Sounds like sarcoidosis, but it ends there. So really, this is a, a, a phenotype of sarcoidosis, and it can also be called acute sarcoidosis. So what this means is that it kind of comes on suddenly, and it has very similar manifestations to sarcoidosis, but it comes on suddenly and then it goes away. Whereas sarcoidosis does not really go away, you need to induce a remission with steroids. Some differences between Lofgren's and sarcoid. Uh, with Lofgren's, look at this, it's a Swedish name. <laughs> Swedish, just like me. Uh, so it uh, tends to be in Scandinavian people as well as people more generally of Northern European descent like English and Irish. It does not have lupus pernio. So if you see lupus pernio, you're dealing with sarcoidosis. It tends to be acute rather than chronic and it does have a better prognosis. It tends to go away within a year or two. You will treat Lofgren syndrome symptomatically. So you'll give NSAIDs, for instance, for the pain. If you have a more severe case, uh, then you can go ahead and give steroids or immunosuppressants, but that tends to not be necessary. All right, so to recap, sarcoidosis is a multisystemic non-caseating granulomatous disease of unknown etiology. It tends to affect the lungs most uh, commonly and most severely. Um, and you'll see it in the surrounding lymph nodes. When you do a chest x-ray, it'll be in those hilar lymph nodes, and it'll be a bilateral distribution. The classic presentation is in women, especially black women. 
Uh, and it's very insidious. Um, so often they won't be able to tell you when it came on. It's just very, very, very gradual um, increase in the symptoms. Shortness of breath, chest discomfort, constitutional signs, and those cutaneous signs like lupus perineo and erythema nodosum. The best initial diagnostic test is a chest x-ray, and the most accurate test is a biopsy, can either be of the lung or of the lymph node. And then the mainstay of treatment is systemic corticosteroids. You can give prednisone for that. There are also steroid sparing agents, but typically the corticosteroids will suffice.